All right, everybody, welcome back. So today we have a lot to do. I'm going to get started. We're going to continue talking about Java objects today, and we're going to continue looking at how we can organize objects into hierarchies using this concept of inheritance that we started looking at on Monday. And then we're going to introduce one of the more interesting features of that goes along with these hierarchies, which is the ability to work with an entire group of Java classes that share similar features. And that comes about because of how Java's inheritance system works. So I can actually write code that works with an entire category of different types of Java objects without having to know exactly what kind of object each one is. And this is taking advantage of a feature of Java's object model called polymorphism. Big word, sounds a little scary, not really. We're gonna demystify it for you. We're also going to connect it with some really beautiful theory uh, in the programming languages area. All right, but let me just uh, talk about what's gonna happen over the next couple days. So um, this is one of the points in this semester where I get a sense people are a little tired, a little grumpy. Um, you have midterms and other classes and stuff like that. Uh, the projector is grumpy, clearly. Um, all right, so here's what we're gonna do. On Friday, today we're gonna talk about polymorphism. We're gonna do some uh, look and review some stuff about inheritance, which we introduced on Monday. And then on Friday, we're gonna take a break from class. So no class on Friday. Uh, I won't be here. You guys hate class that much? That's so bad. Everything you guys applaud for is like, makes me feel a little bad about myself. It's like, really? You don't like the book, you don't like class? All right. Hopefully you like me a little bit at least. If not, come to office hours and then you'll definitely not like me. Um, all right, so yeah, take the day off, sleep in at 11, but I mean, yeah, sleep until noon, um, go to office hours, get MP1 done. You know, I see a lot of people making good progress on that MP, um, finish it up. We are having class today, it's not Friday. Okay, on Monday, we'll do a kind of a little bit of a slowdown session where we review Java objects, mop up anything we might have missed today. Um, I'll do some examples from this week's homework problems, uh, show you how to work out some of those in cases where you might have been confused. Um, and then on Wednesday, we'll keep talking about polymorphism. All right, this is an important topic and something that I wanna make sure uh, that we get clear before we go on. Okay, so, Last time we talked about inheritance, and we introduced the new keyword in Java that allows us to establish relationships between these new Java classes that we're creating. It's all moving very fast, right? This is getting very exciting. So first, we broke open Java's type system and we got in there. We can now build our own types in Java by declaring a class and showing Java how this particular type of object is supposed to behave. So that's really cool. We can also establish relationships between our classes, and this is gonna be something that it's gonna be, we're gonna talk about how to do it first, and then it's gonna take a little while for this to become clear about why this is so useful. But it will. And in particular, we actually have a section of this uh, semester's machine project where you're gonna go back and you're gonna kinda unify some of the code from the target mode that you worked on for MP0 and the area mode that you're working on now. You might think, well, these, these share a lot of common features, and it turns out they do, and in one of the later checkpoints, you're gonna go back and refactor that code to pull out the common pieces, and you're gonna utilize this concept of polymorphism that we're talking about today. So, you know, Java's object hierarchy, Java's type system in general, again, is about building programs that interface with the real world, being able to work with entities in the world. So very few real world entities can be described by a single value single integer value, single double value, we actually have to combine different types of data together to do a reasonable job of representing a person or representing, you know, a sports team or representing uh, a particular item of clothing that you might be selling on a website or whatever. You know, the type of things we want to work with in our programs, we need a way to represent that. Java's class system is about allowing us to do, to do that. And not only does that allow us to model real world data, but Java's class system also allows us to model relationships between data that we see in the world, hierarchies, families, groups, you know? 
So, and, and this is something that, and there's a power behind being able to organize things into categories and groups like this. This is one of the reasons why, for example, um, zoologists have spent so much time, centuries, maintaining this tree um, that tries to organize all life on Earth into, and I'm not a zoologist, so I'm not gonna get the names right, but it's like families and subfamilies and species and order and genera and like, there's a lot of Latin words in there or whatever, but the idea here is that, you know, there's some, there are relationships between organisms. Um, at the top, you start out, there are these two, you know, two or three big categories. I am displaying my ignorance here. I think there's two, you know, big categories of, of different types of organisms, and then as you go down, you break them into smaller and smaller groups, right? So we're trying to identify common features of things. Um, so here's an example, uh, just, you know, something I pulled from online somewhere, right? So, you know, these, these things that are below mammal are all mammals. There's a lot of other mammals um, as well, but these are examples of mammals. And then for certain types of um, creature, I can uh, subdivide it further, right? So, for example, cat, feel, uh, well, what are sometimes known as feliforms, is an entire category of creature that includes not only your domestic house cat, um, but also, you know, lions and tigers and panthers and stuff like that, right? Um, by the way, you know, I, I, was, I was laughing today because I made that comment about not, it not being clear whether cats are, are actually a pet or not, but when you have a cat, this is what happens to you. You wake up in the morning and you find something like this and you have no idea what happened, right? So I think, I think something happened last night with me and the cat. Uh, I don't remember what it was, maybe she does, but she left a mark. Um, all right, so we can do the same thing in Java. And the reason for this is because when we work with data on our programs, it can be natural to want to express these kind of taxonomies and relationships that we actually find in real world data, real world entities. Um, it also allows us, and you're gonna see this, to organize our projects in ways that allow us to reuse code between multiple classes. So when we have two classes that are starting to share a lot of common functionality, a lot of times that's because they're really two different kinds of the same thing. So what we can do is we can create uh, the thing that they're the same kind of and pull some of the functionality into that super class, a parent class, and then just have the children you know, implement whatever additional functionality they might need. I'll show you an example of this. That sounds very abstract, but it's actually uh, pretty, pretty practical. Okay, so here's Java's object tree. And you could actually do this. This is not the whole thing. It would be way too small to see, even on your laptop. You can take any piece of Java code. You can take any Java class and all the Java classes you wanted to think about, and you can organize them into this type of data structure. This is something that is commonly known as a tree. We will talk more about trees later in the class when we talk about data structures. Um, uh, the trees are typically looked at upside down. You might want to actually think of them as sort of roots, right? Um, so at the top is the parent class of everything in Java. Everything in Java, if you follow it up the tree, you eventually get to this special class called object that we'll talk about in a minute. And again, this is just one tiny little uh, piece of the entire Java class hierarchy. But this is, this is actually, you know, this, this is something, so there's, you could imagine there's a character class, okay? Character is one type of thing we might want to model in the world. Character is an entire class of, of entities. I can further break down characters into uh, two different types of character. There are characters that represent a numerical quantity that we sometimes refer to as digits or are part of our ability to represent numerical quantities, digits. And then there are letters. I don't know enough about other languages to know if this uh, separation exists in other languages, but maybe it does, but maybe it's not so clear. In, you know, the Latin alphabet, we have certain characters that represent digits, and then those characters aren't used as part of words unless you're like using lead speak or something like that, right? Um, but, and then, so I can further divide character to digits and letters, right? And I can divide letters, and again, this is now very certain Latin al alphabet English sensor, right? I have letters that I refer to as vowels and letters I refer to as consonants, right? Depending on how they function in spoken language. And again, that, that probably doesn't match up with other languages. So if you did this type of uh, taxonomy for another language, you would need to do it differently. Um, okay, but this is an example of a tree. 
So let me just, uh, you know, this is maybe something that not all of you have seen before, so let me just make sure that it's clear what's happening here. So every, the, this, if I go from one of these nodes and go up, I go to its parent. So digit's parent class is character. Character's parent class, character's parent class is object. If I go down, I'm finding the children of that particular class. So digit would be declared to extend character. Letter would be declared to extend character. Vowel would be declared to extend letter. Any questions about this before we go on? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a great question. So the question is, does this have any relationship with the primitive type care? It actually does. So, and, and, and we'll come back and talk about this later in the class. So for reasons that I'm not going to get into right now, Java actually has, for every primitive type, it has something called an object wrapper. So it has an object class that holds one value of that type. So there, for int, there's something called capital integer. For character, for car, did we decide how to pronounce it? I can't remember. Uh, for, for car, it's capital character. I'll t these are sometimes known as boxing types. I will come back and talk about them later in the class. There is no need for them yet, but it does have a relationship with car. Good question. Other questions about this hierarchy? Okay. So, like I said, every object in Java but one has a parent. And it doesn't matter whether you just say that you're, it, it, you, you may think, I don't want a parent. I sprung from the head of a god. I don't need a parent. Um, but it doesn't matter. Even if you don't declare that you extend another class in Java, you extend object. So these two class declarations are equivalent. If you do not declare explicitly that you extend object, you extend object. There is no alternative. There's only one class in Java that does not have a parent. That class is capital O object. Okay, and I will try to make it as clear as possible when we're talking about objects and Java's class system, whether I'm talking about capital O object or an object. But capital O object is the parent class of everything in Java. If you take every Java class and you go to its parent and its parent's parent and its parent's parent, and sometimes there are very long relationships. We go to see some really complicated, mature projects. IntelliJ, for example, I think is written in Java, right? So if you went and looked at the IntelliJ source code, you might find classes where it might take you lots and lots and lots of parents to get to object, but you will always get there. You start at any class in Java, you go to that class's parent, that class's parent, that class's parent, you keep repeating that process until you get, until you don't find a class that has a parent and you will get to object. This is a design choice about Java. Other languages don't all have this feature, so there are some other languages that allow you to establish your own trees that aren't rooted at the same place. But in Java, everything is rooted at object. Okay. So this is what results from that decision. So remember last time, one of the, or two, two times ago when we started talking about, uh, well sorry, not last time, we talked about inheritance. One of the ways that we started that conversation was posing this mystery about why Java classes have these methods that they didn't declare or provide an implementation for, like two string. I can take any Java object and I can call a two-string method on it that takes no arguments and returns a string. Why can I do that? Because that method is declared by capital O object. So there's a small number of methods in Java. I can't remember exactly how many, but it's like under 10, or maybe around 10, it's not very many. It's certainly not like string, where there's like hundreds. There's a small number of methods that are declared as part of the capital O object class. And as a result, every single Java object has these methods. So that's kind of cool, right? Um, you might wonder why is that useful? Because those methods may not do any, very many, anything useful, but we'll talk about that in a sec, right? But if you have any, so if I give you an object in Java, as long as you know it's on, if I give you any variable, as long as you know that it doesn't contain a primitive type, you can call two strings. It will always work, okay? So here's an example I have of the dog class. The dog class is not declared to extend object, but it implicitly extends object, and because of that, it has a two-string method. 
Now, I'll show you in a minute, that two-string method doesn't actually do something particularly useful at first, but we can customize that behavior and make it more helpful, okay? This is one of, so this is another one of these organizing principles that is gonna be something that we're gonna see again and again throughout the rest of the semester, are these common object methods, okay? They're gonna organize a little bit of our journey through, uh, the rest of Java's class and type system, okay? So here are the ones that I want you to care about. You're welcome to go up and look. There is Javadoc for capital O object that you can go and look at, and you can see the Javadoc declarations of all the methods that every Java object inherits from the object superclass. But here are the ones that we care about, all right? One of them is called toString. toString returns a string, as its name implies. And the idea behind toString is to take an object and return some kind of human-readable representation of that object. The main place where toString is used okay, is during debugging. This is not something that you typically use as part of code that a user is gonna see. When you do that, you need to write more. So for example, imagine that you're trying to take, you know, your area mode and, and, and display it on the screen, right? That, you don't do that using two string. You know, you need to do a lot more work, right, to turn it into a useful graphical representation. But when you're, like, let's say you're debugging and you're trying to print off an object and you wanna know some stuff about it, two string is super helpful. Or it can be if you implement it correctly, okay? So that's one of those methods. There are two more that we care about. Oh, two more, maybe three more. Equals. Okay, so this is interesting. There's a notion in Java of object equality. Are two objects the same? It turns out when you create a class in Java, part of what you get to decide is what it means for two instances of your class to be the same. And you do this by implementing this method, okay? So every object has an equality method. I can compare it with any other object, okay? And then finally, there's something called hash code. And this is probably the one that makes the least sense to you right now. Um, it will come back later. It is incredibly useful when we tar start building some more interesting data structures that are, uh, that we can use to store and work with different types of Java objects. Okay, for now you can think about it, it returns an int, and the idea is that this int is supposed to um, represent all, like kind of combine together as a hash. Has anyone ever had a hash for breakfast before? Really? It's really good, you should try it. It's like a hash is, you know, a bunch of stuff all combined together, chopped up and all thrown in the same place. So that's kind of what hash code is supposed to do. It's supposed to take all the object's contents and reduce it down to one int that is supposed to change if the object's contents change, but not change if they don't. And again, we'll come back and we'll talk about this. Okay. So, you might wonder, you know, why is it useful? Uh, why are these um, object methods defined on object useful? Because, you know, think about it. Let me go back here. Let's look at, uh, let's look at dog, let's look at dog again, okay? So dog has, I'm gonna reload the slides. Yeah, there we go, better. Okay, so dog has a name, right? But it, but you know, the two string method is defined on its parent, on the object class. So the object two string method is not gonna be able to print anything useful about this dog. Probably the thing I wanna print if I print off a dog is its name. It's the only piece of state it has right now. That would be helpful during debugging. If I have a bunch of dogs, figure out which, you know, there's a bug in my code that's caused by trying to do some operation on a particular instance of dog, which dog is breaking my code? You know, printing off its name would be helpful. Maybe its name accidentally got set to null or something like that, okay? So what you will typically do is you will not use the methods that are defined by the object superclass. They're not very helpful. They don't know anything about your class. Instead, you'll do something called override them. What does that mean? So overriding a method means replacing a method that you inherited from your parent or your parent's parent or one of your ancestors with your own implementation, okay? 
So here what I'm doing is I have a dog class, the dog has a name, and I've decided it would be more useful during debugging to print the name. And so instead, now my dog class is gonna have a two-string method no matter whether I override it or not because I'm inheriting it from my parent, which is a uh, capital object here because I didn't extend anything. But if I want the name method, the two-string method to be more useful, I override it and I just return the name of the dog. Now, when I print this object, it's gonna print that name, okay? Let me also stop and pause and give you a, a brief introduction to how, when, we you know, when you call a method on an object, how does Java figure out which one to use? So here's what it does. It starts in the, here it's gonna start in my dog class and it's gonna look for a method called toString. That method has to take no arguments. It has to match the type signature that's used in the call. Note that this is done by the compiler not at runtime, which is helpful because the compiler will catch these errors for you. So in this case, the compiler finds a method called toString that takes no arguments, and so that's the one that gets used. If it doesn't find that, it goes up and it looks in object, and it finds, as it looks in my parent class, it finds the method there and it uses that one. If it doesn't find the method there, then it, then a failure occurs. So just to, you know, put up on a slide what I just said, Whenever I am looking for a variable or for a method to call or to modify, I start in the class that I'm working with, and I say, does it have a variable with that name or a method with the right signature, the name and the argument? If so, I use that. If not, look in the parent class. But remember, the parent class might define its own private method, and so I won't, I can't inherit a private method. So I only look at the parents class public and protected methods. I can't use its private methods. Those are private to it. And I basically continue this process until either I find the thing I'm looking for or I get to object. If object has it, I'm good. If object doesn't, then I, the, the compiler fails and it'll give me an error message. All right, so let's play around with this a little bit. Um, Okay, so I've, I've created this arbitrary and convoluted class structure. Um, so I've got an animal class that's the parent here that extends object, and I might as well, I'll just, you know what, it doesn't matter. Usually, you'll almost never see anyone extend object explicitly because you don't need to. All right, so animal extends object, pet extends animal, dog extends pet, old dog extends dog, Sweet old dog extends old dog. I should really have a, another super subclass here called itchy old dog, because that's sort of more what he is these days. Um, all right, so I'm creating a, a sweet old dog object, an instance of the class sweet old dog. Now let's see what happens when I call toString. There is no toString method defined on sweet old dog. Oh, it's mad at me about something. Check style. There we go, okay. So what happened here? Let's talk about the process that Java went through when it looked for this method. It started, so it said, okay, I have an instance of this class called sweet old dog. Does sweet old dog provide a method called toString that takes no arguments? No, so where do I look next? We know dog doesn't provide that method. What's the next class I look at? Yeah. Old dog. Go to Sweet Old Dog's parent. Does old dog provide that method? Nope. Where do I look next? Dog. Where do I look next? Pet. Where do I look next? Animal. Where do I look next? Object. Now, if you don't override two strings, so if you don't provide your own implementation of this method, this is what object provides for you, okay? You might wonder, wh what is this? Okay, so this is combining the only two pieces of information that object knows about your class. The first one is its name. And then there's an at sign, and then there's, like, random, uh, 
thing that looks, you know, it changes every time I run it. Um, run it again. Anyone want to make a wild guess about what that is? Yeah. Yeah, it's, I think it's the hash code for the object, actually. And I think it has something to do with where it's stored in memory. But this is not useful. Like, if you were trying to debug your program, this is not useful. Okay? So instead, let's override the toString method. So I'm gonna provide a public method called toString. Okay. And let's just return sweet old dog for now. We're gonna make this better in a minute. Okay. So now you see what happened. I have an instance of sweet old dog, so I started looking there. And I found the toString method right away. So it's done. Now let's, uh, let's imagine that every pet, so I'm gonna call, let's, let's just do this here for now. Let's, ma let's imagine, let's make every street, sweet old dog have a name. And then let's provide a constructor that sets the name. And now, let's just return the name. Okay, so the first thing that's gonna happen is I'm gonna get a compiler error because my constructor, my empty constructor is gone because I provided a new one. And now I have to provide a name. And now I can provide the name during debugging. If I create another sweet old dog, Let's print the lose name. There we go. Okay. So now let's try something a little bit different. Let's say we have an old dog, but one that's not sweet. I would never do that to Choo Choo, but let's make Baloo an old dog. Baloo's pretty sweet too, but okay. Now what's going to happen? Okay, so I've moved one level up from sweet old dog. So what am I gonna get when I run this? Oh, yeah, it doesn't have a constructor that takes a name. So let's get rid of that. Now again, I'm seeing the default object to string method that's printing the name of the type, which is old dog, and a memory address. So now let's see how this, let's experiment with how this name resolution works. So let's add a method up here. Uh, okay, we'll do, String. Let's put return animal. What's gonna happen now? All right, so now I've added a two string method. And this seems like it's gonna be useful because now this two string, th this is a slightly, maybe a slightly more useful two string method than the one um, that I get from object. And now this is gonna be a default two string method that pet can use and dog can use and old dog can use. And so when I run this, what I should see is, you know, animal. Um, uh oh, okay, so I have a problem here. What's the problem? Yeah. Yeah, so I need to make this public. Now it works. So again, let, I think, you know, let's pause here because it's really important to understand how this works, how the Java compiler does this. So Choo Choo's, when I start looking for the two string method with Choo Choo, I start in the sweet old dog class, which overrides two string, okay? And so that's the method I get. I get the method declared on line 14. When I start looking for a two-string method for an old dog, I don't get the one defined in sweet old dog because I'm in sweet old dog's parent. Old dog doesn't override two-string. Pet dog doesn't override two-string. Pet doesn't override two-string. Animal does. And so that's the one I get. Now again, this can go wrong in a variety of different ways. So for example, let's make a public string, uh, two-string, and let's have it take an argument. Have it return nothing. Again, same thing. 
So when I'm looking for the method to call, it has to match the type signature exactly. I'm looking for a method called toString that takes no arguments, not looking for a method called toString that takes an int. If I change this, remove the int argument, now it'll print nothing. Or I could have it print old dog. Questions about this, yeah? Ah, so the question is, when do I use this? Have you guys seen this, anno this annotation override on your code in places? I think IntelliJ will encourage you to use this, yeah. So this, I, I, I was thinking about whether or not to talk about this today, and I just don't want to talk about annotations at all. Um, but the reason why that exists is that will help check to make sure that you're actually overriding a method, right? So if you put overrides on something and you're not overriding a method, the compiler will say, wait, hold on, you have told me that this is supposed to be, this method is supposed to override something, but it didn't override anything, right? And so it's a good thing to do to avoid problems like this, right? Whoops. Looked the same to me, you know, like, yeah. So this will, it, it, this is essentially a debugging technique. It's not mandatory, yeah. I mean, I'm overriding the method right here, and I don't have any of those keys. Okay. So let's talk about a few more tricks that we can use when uh, we start uh, being able to establish and utilize inheritance relationships between job classes. So, we talked about constructors. We said a class frequently wants to do some setup when it's created. And when I'm creating, so one way to think about it is when I create go back to our previous slide. When I create a sweet old dog, I'm also creating an old dog and a dog and a pet and an animal. And an object, actually. And so it's possible that old dog needs to do some work to set itself up, and it's possible that dog needs to do some work to set itself up. And so the question is, if I start, if I call sweet old dog, I'm gonna run the sweet old dog constructor. Well, what if I also want to run the dog constructor? And so this is a place that I use something called super. I know, sounds awesome, right? There's no magic powers, unfortunately. It doesn't, like, immediately cause you to get full credit on the MP. Um, instead, what it does is it calls the parent's constructor. Super is only used in the, in the constructor. And it also has to be the first thing that you do. So the first thing you do when you're setting up a new instance of an object is call super to set up the parent. Then the child can do any additional work that the child has to do to finish the job, okay? So let's see an example of this. So here's an example, right? I've got a pet. My pet, every pet has a type. Type would be dog, cat, ferret, rabbit, hamster, snake, lizard, lion. You know, some pets are bad ideas, but um, yeah. So the type is the, is something that's a that's a that's a property of the pet. Then I have you know a subclass of the pet that inherits from it, dog. Now when I create a dog, I know what kind of pet this is. It's a dog. So the first thing the dog constructor does is it calls the superclass constructor on the pet class. That's what super will do. So when I start running my constructor, the first thing I'll do is call super. That calls this constructor right here. It looks for a constructor in the parent that takes a single string argument. There is one. That constructor sets the type of the pet class that dog is inheriting from. Then the dog constructor, and this is a, a common pattern. This is why super is the first thing that's called. So the first thing you do is you allow your parent class to do anything it needs to do to initialize itself. And then you do any of the things that you need to do to finish initializing your class. And that typically involves, for example, initializing certain fields that your class has that your parent doesn't. So not every pet has different breeds. So dog has added a breed property to its uh, parent. So every dog will have a type, which will always be dog, and a breed, which could vary. When I create a dog, I need to provide a breed. So I call the superclass constructor to create the pet, finish creating the pet object, and then I set the breed to whatever was passed to the constructor. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so the, it's a great question. So the question was, what happens if I have multiple, uh, well, okay, so what happens if I have multiple parents? What happens if I have multiple parents in Java? I don't have multiple parents in Java. Yeah, so every Java class will, can only have one parent, right? So were you talking about ancestors? Yeah, okay, yeah, I just wanna make sure we were clear about that. Yeah, this is, because there are other, there are other languages where you can have multiple parents for a class, and that creates a lot of problems. Java decided to ignore that mess. Every class has one parent. Now, what about ancestors, okay? So when I call super, I run the constructor of my parent. It's possible that my parent will do what? My parent's constructor, the first thing it does might be to call super. Have its parent set up. Its parent might, the first thing it might do might be call super. So I can run this all the way up. At some point, there's a class that might not need any setup, and so I might not call super, right? But that's how things work, right? So that's how I would get, so, and, and we, if, if I had a minute, which I don't think I do, uh, we could go back here, and you could add constructors to all of these, and you could call super, and you could see things flowing all the way up. Yeah. So here, let's say that sweet old dog, the constructor calls super, that starts running the old dog constructor, let's say that calls super, it starts running the dog constructor, let's say that calls super, starts running the pet constructor, and then one by one they're gonna finish, and finally sweet old dog's gonna finish doing whatever it needs to do. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah. Good question. All right, so let's make sure this works. This works fine. Uh, Choochoo.type is, um, and let's print choochoo.read. Oh, I have to make this make this public just for the sake of the example. Okay, good. All right, any questions here? All right, so now, right before we take a break, let me try to blow your minds a little bit here, because this is cool. So Java's type system enables us to utilize this feature called polymorphism. Right, and polymorphism is, is, is something that has a funny name, has a funny definition, cool tie-in to theory, a lot of practical applications, but it's gonna take you some time and some practice to get comfortable with it. So just be patient with yourself, it's okay, you know? Uh, particularly some of you that came in with some background, this might be those, one of those moments where, you know, the class actually gets hard for a couple of days, which is good, right? I hope you get something out of it along with everybody else, right? So the definition of polymorphism, is this idea that the provision of a single interface to entities of different types. Um, polymorphism literally implies that a single Java object can behave like other Java objects, depending on the context in which I'm using it, right? Essentially, as I, I sort of hinted at in the beginning of class, polymorphism allows me to work with an entire class of Java objects that all share similar features, okay? So we're gonna talk about three different types of uh, Java polymorphism, and we're also gonna talk about interfaces in a couple of weeks, because interfaces are incredibly cool. But for now, let me identify two different types of Java polymorphism that we're going to think about and to continue to think about. This, this, is, the one, this is the one that comes up sort of naturally now once we've been talking about inheritance. This is something called subtype polymorphism, okay? So again, polymorphism, morph to change, polymultiple. So this implies, again, that every Java object can actually kind of behave like more than one object. And every Java object that you work with typically can actually behave like at least two kinds of Java objects. The first one is whatever class you, you created. So in this case, that's a dog, right? The second one is object. There can be more depending on the inheritance relationships that you've created, okay? So here, because dog extends pet, I can pass a dog to any function that expects a pet and it will work. I can also pass a dog to any function that extends, that expects an object, and it will also work. The 
capabilities that I can use are determined by the type of object that I consider the dog to be. Even as I'm saying this, I'm thinking, this is confusing. It's okay, it's gonna make more sense in a minute, okay? But here's the thing to think about. So every pet is also an object because it extends object. So every pet can either be considered as a pet or it can also be considered as an object because it extends object. Every dog actually can be treated as three different types of objects. It can be treated as a dog, that's what we created it as, but it can also be treated as a pet, it can also pretend to be a pet, and it can also pretend or morph into an object, because pet extends object. So any of my ancestors I can morph into. So a, a dog can essentially sneak into a function that expects an object and behave like an object in that function. It never stops being a dog, but it can essentially disguise itself as an object um, for the purposes of, of running that particular function, okay? So here's how this works, okay? And here's an example of something that, you know, is again something that should mystify you a little bit. So this code will work, okay? Let's see what's going on here. I have my example class. I want to draw your attention to the method declared on line 14. It's called print anything. It's static, it's void, doesn't return anything, it's public. The argument it takes, and you haven't seen this before, but there's nothing can, you know, particularly special about it. It takes a single argument called to print. What's the type of that argument? Big O object, the parent of everything in Java or the ancestor of everything. What it does is it calls the toString method on that uh, variable and prints the result, okay? So again, this is one of those places where you're looking at something that should not make sense to you because we've never seen this before. There's a new feature of the language that's emerging in this example. Because what am I doing here in my main method? I'm creating two different types of object. I've created this little object hierarchy right here where I have a pet and then I have a dog that extends pet. Pet obviously extends object implicitly. I created a dog on line nine. I created a pet on line 10. And what's weird about this? We have never seen this before. That's normal, whatever. I can create objects, I'm good at that, I, I'm comfortable with that. But I'm doing something here that I have not seen before. What is it? What's wrong with this code? I mean, if I had showed you this and asked you to identify an error in it on a, on a quiz or on a, you know, um, if we were just talking in class, what, what would you see about this that looks wrong? If you didn't understand some of these relationships. There's something wrong with this code. There's something that doesn't make sense. Yeah, so okay, so I, I agree it's a little confusing to print anything that's declared down here, but that's actually okay. The compiler's gonna figure that out. But you're on the right track. There's something about print anything, okay? What's wrong with this code? Yeah. Okay, well, pet doesn't define a two-string method, but what, what's gonna happen? If pet doesn't override two-string, what two-string implementation am I gonna get? object, that's okay. Again, something else here. This doesn't, there's something about this that does not make sense. Someone tell me. Yeah. Yeah. So, one, print anything. Remember, when Java looks for a function, it looks at the type signature. So what's the type of the argument that I'm supposed to pass to print anything? What am I passing it on line 11? What kind of object is that? That's a dog. What am I passing it on line 12? Why is this okay? So again, normally this would not be okay, but here's the thing. Remember what I said just a slide ago. Every dog, 
can also morph into an object because it extends object through pet. Every pet can also morph into an object because it extends dog. Sorry, it extends object directly. Sorry. But again, this is, this is weird. Okay? And here's what's happening. This is something that's called an upcast. Java is taking an object and it is morphing it into one of its ancestors. And it'll do this for you automatically. You don't have to do anything special here. So when I call print anything, while print anything is running, my dog has become an object. That sounds terrible, right? Dogs are not objects. Um, my cat, my pet, has become an object. All right? So again, this will work. You can run the code, and it'll do exactly what we've been doing throughout class. All right? But every, as that code runs, so here's the other thing that's weird, okay? So there's, we, we, we pointed out the one weird thing, which is that somehow I can pass a dog to a function that expects an object. Somehow I can pass a pet to a function that extends an object. That's starting a little bit of head scratcher. But when this function runs, it's clear that those objects still know what kind of object they are, right? Because when I call to string on my dog object, here on line 11, I get the toString method defined by dog. I don't get the one defined by object. When I call toString on the pet that didn't override toString, I get the default object implementation. But it's clear that Java has not forgotten what kind of objects these actually are, right? Right? And I can do this like this as well. I'll come back, I'll talk about this next time. All right, downcasting, I'm gonna leave, uh, for, for next time when we come back and review um, polymorphism. And actually, I think instance of I should, I should leave as well. This I will come back and review next time. Let me just finish by connecting this quickly to a really nice piece of computer science theory. So this is not something we get to do very often, but it's always really exciting when it actually happens. So there's something called the Liskov substitutability principle, the list off substitution principle. So substitutability is an idea in computer science that says that if there's some desirable property, if S is a subtype of T, then any object of T can be replaced by S without violating, uh, without, uh, you know, altering any of the desirable properties of T, okay? That's actually a really deep principle in computer programming languages. Um, Who's the Liskov in Liskov? Barbara Liskov, Turing Award winner, professor at MIT, um, someone who did incredibly important seminal work on programming languages. This principle was named after her. What's the Turing Award? Has anyone heard of the Turing Award before? Okay, well now you all have. This is the Nobel Prize for computer science. There is no Nobel Prize for computer science. Instead, we have our own award. It's named after Alan Turing, one of the uh, people who did incredibly important seminal work uh, on computer science very early on. Uh, there's an award given every year. Um, and this is something you should know, right? So you should know who won the Turing Award last year or the year before. Uh, these are people to look at. They're people whose work you should review and try to appreciate. Some of it will make sense to you, a lot of it will, actually, because a lot of the people that win this award have done things that affect the world of technology that you experience every day. Okay, so I'll come back and do this next time because I went a little, a little slower than I thought uh, today, which is fine, okay? Um, I have two quick announcements as you guys are, are getting up. Okay, this one's important. I feel, after some discussions with the course staff, I feel like it's important to remind you about the cheating policies in this class, okay? Everything you submit for the MP is going to be automatically checked against everything else, everybody else submitted, okay? Um, we expect you to struggle in this class. I know some of you are frustrated at this point in the semester. I get that, that's okay. Frustration goes along with the work. But you can't let that push you to the point where you're willing to do something wrong. This is 
so we have a full cheating policy up on the website. Let me make this very easy for you, okay? Here's the simple rule. If you are talking in a human language about the problem, you are fine. I don't want to discourage you from sitting down in office hours and chatting about how you're solving the problem with other people. That's okay. You know, oh, well, I had to do this and I did this other thing. Okay, fine. Once you start exchanging source code in any way, if you sing it to somebody, if you write it down as a poem and hand it to them on a piece of paper, right? If you send it in a Snapchat message or in a group chat or over smoke signals or whatever it is, that is wrong and we will catch you, right? Um, so please keep this in mind as you work on MP1. Again, I don't want this to have a chilling effect. I want you guys to help each other collaborate, but once we start seeing, you know, people sending little bits of source code around, that, that is past what we're willing to accept. All right, um, enjoy, uh, we'll talk about frustration on Monday. Enjoy the weekend. Um, good luck finishing up MP1. I will see you on Monday. No class on Friday.